In the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire, the Latin word castrum, plural castra, was a building, or plot of land, used as a fortified military camp. Castrum was the term used for different sizes of camps including a large legionary fortress, smaller auxiliary forts, temporary encampments, and «marching» forts. The diminutive form castellum was used for fortlets, typically occupied by a detachment of a cohort or a century. In English, the terms Roman fortress, Roman fort, and Roman camp are commonly used for castrum. However, scholastic convention tends toward the use of the words camp, marching camp, and fortress as a translation of castrum. For a list of known castra, see List of castra. Etymology <inaudible> <inaudible> The etymology, or origin, of a word frequently reveals its deepest level of meaning, associating it with the ancient culture from which it came. Historical linguists resort to the concept of linguistic archaeology, uncovering layers of meaning through linguistic change. Latin is undisputedly one of the Italic languages, a group within the Indo-European languages. The fact that forms of castrum also appear in Oscan and Umbrian, two other Italic languages, suggests an origin at least as old as Proto-Italic language. Julius Pokorny major Indo-Europeanist of the 20th century in his Encyclopedia of Indo-European Roots, traces a probable derivation from asterisk k, s, schneiden cut in asterisk k, s tro m, schneidwerkzug cutting tool. The k, is not a letter or an IPA symbol. Called the circumflex k, it began as a symbol to transliterate ka Cyrillic into Latin script in the scientific transliteration of Cyrillic. More recently the latter was incorporated into ISO 9, the K, as one of a group of sounds called on the one hand dorsal consonants because articulated by constricting the back of the tongue, or dorsum, against the roof of the mouth, and on the other are subclassified by the exact point on the roof of the mouth, of interest here mainly the velars, which use the velum, and the palatals, which use the hard palate. The IPA classification offers a different point of view on the palatals, that they are formed from the other dorsals by moving the point of contact up to the palate, a supposed process called palatalization. The IPA symbol for the K, is therefore K, where the superscript J represents the supposed palatalization. In more ordinary terms, the K sound can be articulated either up on the palate or down on the velum. To the etymologists, Proto-Indo-European is conceived to have contained a group of words that began with palatals and another that began with velars. After this proto-phase, that is, after the formation of the major language groups, the palatal group changed according to one of two different phonetic destinies, one termed centimization and the other satimization, to create the centum and satim languages. In centimization the k, changed to k, merging the group with the velar group. The Italic languages are centum. Asterisk k, estrum therefore became asterisk castrum in the Italic languages, but there was a change in meaning as well. These Italic reflexes based on asterisk castrum include oscan castris genitive case and umbrian castruo, castruviuf accusative case. They have the same meaning, says Pokorni, as Latin fundus, an estate, or tract of land. This is not any land, but is a prepared or cultivated tract, such as a farm enclosed by a fence or a wooden or stone wall of some kind. Cornelius Nepos uses Latin castrum in that sense, when Alcibiades deserts to the Persians, Pharnabazus gives him an estate castrum worth 500 talents in tax revenues. This is a change of meaning from the reflexes in other languages, which still mean some sort of knife, axe, or spear. Pokorny explains it as lager als abgeschnittenes stuck land, a lager, as a cut-off piece of land. If this is the civilian interpretation, the military version must be military reservation, a piece of land cut off from the common land around it and modified for military use. All castra must be defended by works, often no more than a stockade, for which the soldiers carried stakes, and a ditch. The castra could be prepared under attack within a hollow square or behind a battle line. Considering that the earliest military shelters were tents made of hide or cloth, and all but the most permanent bases housed the men in tents placed in quadrangles and separated by numbered streets, one castrum may well have acquired the connotation of tent. <laughs> <laughs> Linguistic development of the military castra The commonest Latin syntagmata here phrases for the term castra are castra stativa Permanent camp, fortresses Castra estiva Summer camp, fortresses Castra hiberna 
Winter Camp Fortresses Castra Navalia or Castra Nautica Navy Camp Fortresses in Latin the term castrum is much more frequently used as a proper name for geographical locations e.g. Castrum Album Castrum Anui Castrum Novum Castrum Truntinum Castrum Virgium the plural was also used as a place name, as Castra Cornelia, and from this come the Welsh place name prefix caer and English suffixes castor and chester, e.g., Winchester, Lancaster. Castrorum filius, son of the camps, was one of the names used by the Emperor Caligula and then also by other emperors. Castro, also derived from Castrum, is a common Spanish family name as well as toponym in Italy, the Balkans and Spain and other Hispanophone countries, either by itself or in various compounds such as the World Heritage Site of Giracastor earlier Argyrocastro. The terms stratopedon army camp and Ferian fortification were used by Greek language authors to translate Castrum and Castellum, respectively. Topic. Description A castrum was designed to house and protect the soldiers, their equipment and supplies when they were not fighting or marching. This most detailed description that survives about Roman military camps is De Munitionibus Castrorum, a manuscript of eleven pages that dates most probably from the late 1st to early 2nd century AD. Regulations required a major unit in the field to retire to a properly constructed camp every day. As soon as they have marched into an enemy's land, they do not begin to fight until they have walled their camp about, nor is the fence they raise rashly made, or uneven, nor do they all abide ill it, nor do those that are in it take their places at random, but if it happens that the ground is uneven, it is first leveled, their camp is also four square by measure, and carpenters are ready, in great numbers, with their tools, to erect their buildings for them. To this end a marching column ported the equipment needed to build and stock the camp in a baggage train of wagons and on the backs of the soldiers. Camps were the responsibility of engineering units to which specialists of many types belonged, officered by architecti, chief engineers, who requisitioned manual labor from the soldiers at large as required. They could throw up a camp under enemy attack in as little as a few hours. Judging from the names, they probably used a repertory of camp plans, selecting the one appropriate to the length of time a legion would spend in it, tertia castra, quarta castra, etc. A camp of three days, four days, etc. More permanent camps were castra stativa standing camps. The least permanent of these were castra estiva or estivalia, summer camps, in which the soldiers were housed sub pelibus or sub tentories, under tents. Summer was the campaign season. For the winter the soldiers retired to Castra Hiberna containing barracks and other buildings of more solid materials, with timber construction gradually being replaced by stone, the camp allowed the Romans to keep arrested and supplied army in the field. Neither the Celtic nor Germanic armies had this capability, they found it necessary to disperse after only a few days. The largest castra were legionary fortresses built as bases for one or more whole legions. From the time of Augustus, more permanent castra with wooden or stone buildings and walls were introduced as the distant and hard won boundaries of the expanding empire required permanent garrisons to control local and external threats from warlike tribes. Previously, legions were raised for specific military campaigns and subsequently disbanded, requiring only temporary castra. From then on many castra of various sizes were established many of which became permanent settlements. Topic. Plan of forts Topic. Sources and origins From the most ancient times Roman camps were constructed according to a certain ideal pattern, formally described in two main sources, the Demunitionibus castrorum and the works of Polybius. P. Florida. Vegetius Renatus has a small section on entrenched camps as well. The terminology varies but the basic plan is the same. The hypothesis of an Etruscan origin is a viable alternative. Topic. Layout The ideal enforced a linear plan for a camp or fort, a square for camps to contain one legion or smaller unit, a rectangle for two legions, each legion being placed back to back with headquarters next to each other. Laying it out was a geometric exercise conducted by experienced officers called metators, who used graduated measuring rods called desompte, ten footers, 
and gromatici who used a grama, a sighting device consisting of a vertical staff with horizontal cross pieces and vertical plumb lines. Ideally the process started in the center of the planned camp at the site of the headquarters tent or building Principia. Streets and other features were marked with colored pennants or rods. The street plans of various present-day cities still retain traces of a Roman camp, for example Marsala in Sicily, the ancient Lilibium, where the name of the main street, the Casaro, perpetuates the name, Castrum. Topic. Wall and ditch The Castrum's special structure also defended from attacks. The base Munimentum, fortification was placed entirely within the vallum wall which could be constructed under the protection of the legion in battle formation if necessary the vallum was quadrangular aligned on the cardinal points of the compass the construction crews dug a trench fossa throwing the excavated material inward to be formed into the rampart agar on top of this a palisade of stakes sudas or valley was erected the soldiers had to carry these stakes on the march over the course of time, the palisade might be replaced by a fine brick or stone wall, and the ditch serve also as a moat. A legion-sized camp always placed towers at intervals along the wall with positions between for the division artillery. Topic. Interval Around the inside periphery of the vallum was a clear space, the intervallum, which served to catch enemy missiles, as an access route to the vallum and as a storage space for cattle capita and plunder preta. Legionaries were quartered in a peripheral zone inside the intervallum, which they could rapidly cross to take up position on the vallum. Inside of the legionary quarters was a peripheral road, the Via Sagularis, probably a type of service road, as the sagum, a kind of cloak, was the garment of soldiers. Topic. Streets, gates and central plaza Every camp included Main Street, which ran unimpeded through the camp in a north-south direction and was very wide. The names of streets in many cities formerly occupied by the Romans suggest that the street was called Cardo or Cardus Maximus. This name applies more to cities than it does to ancient camps, typically. Main Street was the Via Principalis. The central portion was used as a parade ground and headquarters area. The headquarters building was called the Praetorium because it housed the praetor or base commander, first officer, and his staff. In the camp of a full legion he held the rank of consul or proconsul but officers of lesser ranks might command. On one side of the Praetorium was the Quastorium, the building of the Quaster supply officer. On the other side was the Forum, a small duplicate of an urban forum, where public business could be conducted. Along the Via Principalis were the homes or tents of the several tribunes in front of the barracks of the units they commanded. The Via Principalis went through the Vallum in the Porta Principalis Dextra, right principal gate, and Porta Principalis Sinistra, left, etc., which were gates fortified with turs, towers. Which was on the north and which on the south depends on whether the praetorium faced east or west, which remains unknown. The central region of the Via Principalis with the buildings for the command staff was called the Principia plural of Principium. It was actually a square, as across this at right angles to the Via Principalis was the Via Praetoria, so called because the praetorium interrupted it. The Via Principalis and the Via Praetoria offered another division of the camp into four quarters. Across the central plaza Principia to the east or west was the main gate, the Porta Pretoria. Marching through it and down, Headquarters Street, a unit ended up in formation in front of the headquarters. The standards of the legion were located on display there, very much like the flag of modern camps. On the other side of the Praetorium the Via Pretoria continued to the wall, where it went through the Porta Decamana. In theory this was the back gate. Supplies were supposed to come in through it and so it was also called, descriptively, the Porta Quastoria. The term decumina, of the tenth, came from the arranging of manipuli or terme from the first to the tenth, such that the tenth was near the intervallum on that side. The Via Pretoria on that side might take the name Via Decumina or the entire Via Pretoria be replaced with Decumanus Maximus. Topic. Canteen. In peaceful times the camp set up a marketplace with the natives in the area. 
They were allowed into the camp as far as the units numbered five halfway to the Praetorium. There another street crossed the camp at right angles to the Via Dicamana, called the Via Quintana, 5th Street. If the camp needed more gates, one or two of the Porta Quintana were built, presumably named Dextra and Sinistra. If the gates were not built, the Porta Dicamana also became the Porta Quintana. At 5th Street, a public market was allowed. Topic. Major buildings The Via Quintana and the Via Principalis divided the camp into three districts, the Lottera Pretorii, the Pretontura and the Retentura. In the Lottera, sides, were the array sacrificial altars, the auguratorium for auspices, the tribunal, where courts martial and arbitrations were conducted it had a raised platform, the guardhouse, the quarters of various kinds of staff and the storehouses for grain horia or meat carnarea. Sometimes the horia were located near the barracks and the meat was stored on the hoof. Analysis of sewage from latrines indicates the legionary diet was mainly grain. Also located in the Lottera was the armamentarium, a longshed containing any heavy weapons and artillery not on the wall. The pretontura, stretching to the front, contained the scamnum legatorum, the quarters of officers who were below general but higher than company commanders legati. Near the Principia were the valetudinarium hospital, veterinarium for horses, fabrica, workshop, metals and wood, and further to the front the quarters of special forces. These included classici. Marines, as most European camps were on rivers and contained a river naval command, a quites, cavalry, explorators, scouts, and vexillary carriers of vexillae, the official pennants of the legion and its units. Troops who did not fit elsewhere also were there. The part of the retentura, stretching to the rear, closest to the Principia contained the quastorium. By the late empire it had developed also into a safekeep for plunder and a prison for hostages and high-ranking enemy captives. Near the quastorium were the quarters of the headquarters guard stators, who amounted to two centuries' companies. If the imperator was present they served as his bodyguard. Barracks <laughs> 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 Further from the quastorium were the tents of the nationes, natives, who were auxiliaries of foreign troops, and the legionaries themselves in double rows of tents or barracks strige. One striga was as long as required and 18 meters wide. In it were two hemistrigia of facing tents centered in its 9 meters strip. Arms could be stacked before the tents and baggage carts kept there as well. Space on the other side of the tent was for passage. In the northern places like Britain, where it got cold in the winter, they would make wood or stone barracks. The Romans would also put a fireplace in the barracks. They had about three bunk beds in it. They had a small room beside it where they put their armor, it was as big as the tents. They would also make these barracks if the fort they had was going to stay there for good. A tent was 3 by 3.5 meters, 0.6 meters for the aisle, 10 men per tent. Ideally a company took ten tents, arranged in a line of ten companies, with the tenth near the Porta Dicamana. Of the sea, 9.2 square meters of bunk space each man received 0.9, or about 0.6 by 1.5 meters, which was only practical if they slept with heads to the aisle. The single tent with its men was called contubernium, also used for squad. A squad during some periods was eight men or fewer. The centurion, or company commander, had a double-sized tent for his quarters, which served also as official company area. Other than there, the men had to find other places to be. To avoid mutiny, it became extremely important for the officers to keep them busy. A covered portico might protect the walkway along the tents. If barracks had been constructed, one company was housed in one barracks building, with the arms at one end and the common area at the other. The company area was used for cooking and recreation, such as gaming. The army provisioned the men and had their bread panis militaris baked in outdoor ovens, but the men were responsible for cooking and serving themselves. They could buy meals or supplementary foods at the canteen. The officers were allowed servants. <laughs> <laughs> Sanitation For sanitary facilities, a camp had both public and private latrines. A public latrine consisted of a bank of seats situated over a channel of running water. 
One of the major considerations for selecting the site of a camp was the presence of running water, which the engineers diverted into the sanitary channels. Drinking water came from wells, however, the larger and more permanent bases featured the aqueduct, a structure running a stream captured from high ground sometimes miles away into the camp. The praetorium had its own latrine, and probably the quarters of the high-ranking officers. In or near the intervallum, where they could easily be accessed, were the latrines of the soldiers. A public bathhouse for the soldiers, also containing a latrine, was located near or on the Via Principalis. Topic. Territory The influence of a base extended far beyond its walls. The total land required for the maintenance of a permanent base was called its territoria. In it were located all the resources of nature and the terrain required by the base, pastures, woodlots, water sources, stone quarries, mines, exercise fields and attached villages. The central castra might also support various fortified adjuncts to the main base, which were not in themselves self-sustaining as was the base. In this category were speculi, watchtowers, castella, small camps, and naval bases. All the major bases near rivers featured some sort of fortified naval installation, one side of which was formed by the river or lake. The other sides were formed by a polygonal wall and ditch constructed in the usual way, with gates and watchtowers. The main internal features were the boat sheds and the docks. When not in use, the boats were drawn up into the sheds for maintenance and protection. Since the camp was placed to best advantage on a hill or slope near the river, the naval base was usually outside its walls. The classici and the optiones of the naval installation relied on the camp for its permanent defense. Naval personnel generally enjoyed better quarters and facilities. Many were civilians working for the military. Topic. Modifications in practice This ideal was always modified to suit the terrain and the circumstances. Each camp discovered by archaeology has its own specific layout and architectural features, which makes sense from a military point of view. If, for example, the camp was built on an outcrop, it followed the lines of the outcrop. The terrain for which it was best suited and for which it was probably designed in distant prehistoric times was the rolling plain. The camp was best placed on the summit and along the side of a low hill, with spring water running in rivulets through the camp and pastureland to provide grazing for the animals. In case of attack, arrows, javelins and sling missiles could be fired down at an enemy tiring himself to come up. For defense troops could be formed in an aces, or battle line outside the gates, where they could be easily resupplied and replenished, as well as being supported by archery from the palisade. The streets, gates and buildings present depended on the requirements and resources of the camp. The gates might vary from two to six and not be centered on the sides. Not all the streets and buildings might be present. Topic. Quadrangular camps in later times Many settlements in Europe originated as Roman military camps and still show traces of their original pattern e.g. Castors in France, Barcelona in Spain. The pattern was also used by Spanish colonizers in America following strict rules by the Spanish monarchy for founding new cities in the New World. Many of the towns of England still retain forms of the word castra in their names, usually as the suffixes castor or chester. Lancaster, Colchester, Tadcaster, Chester, Manchester, Mansetter, Utoxeter and Ribchester, for example. Castle has the same derivation, from the diminutive castellum or little fort, but does not usually indicate a former Roman camp. Whitley Castle however is an exception, referring to the Roman fort of Epicum in Northumberland. <laughs> camp life Activities conducted in a castra can be divided into ordinary and the duty, or the watch. Ordinary activity was performed during regular working hours. The duty was associated with operating the installation as a military facility. For example, none of the soldiers were required to man the walls all the time, but round-the-clock duty always required a portion of the soldiers to be on duty at any time. Duty time was divided into vigilia, the eight watches into which the 24-hour day was divided so they stood guard for three hours that day. 
The Romans used signals on brass instruments to mark time. These were mainly the bacina or bucina, the cornu and the tuba. As they did not possess valves for regulating the pitch, the range of these instruments was somewhat limited. Nevertheless, the musicians anators, brassmen, managed to define enough signals for issuing commands. The instrument used to mark the passage of a watch was the bacina, from which the trumpet derives. It was sounded by a buccinator. Topic. Ordinary life Ordinary camp life began with a bacina call at daybreak, the first watch of the day. The soldiers arose at this time and shortly after collected in the company area for breakfast and assembly. The centurions were up before them and off to the Principia where they and the Aquites were required to assemble. The regimental commanders, the tribunes, were already converging on the praetorium. There the general staff was busily at work planning the day. At a staff meeting the tribunes received the password and the orders of the day. They brought those back to the centuriones, who returned to their company areas to instruct the men. For soldiers, the main item of the agenda was a vigorous training session lasting about a watch long. Recruits received two, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. Planning and supervision of training were under a general staff officer, who might manage training at several camps. According to Vegetius, the men might take a 32 kilometers 20 miles hike or a 6 to 8 kilometers 3.7 to 5.0 miles jog under full pack or swim a river. Marching drill was always in order. Each soldier was taught the use of every weapon and also was taught to ride. Seamanship was taught at naval bases. Soldiers were generalists in the military and construction arts. They practiced archery, spear throwing and above all swordsmanship against posts poly fixed in the ground. Training was taken very seriously and was democratic. Ordinary soldiers would see all the officers training with them including the praetor, or the emperor, if he was in camp. Swordsmanship lessons and use of the shooting range probably took place on the campus, a field, outside the castra, from which English camp derives. Its surface could be lightly paved. Winter curtailed outdoor training. The general might in that case have sheds constructed, which served as field houses for training. There is archaeological evidence in one case of an indoor equestrian ring. Apart from the training, each soldier had a regular job on the base, of which there were a large variety from the various kinds of clerks to the craftsmen. Soldiers changed jobs frequently. The commander's policy was to have all the soldiers skilled in all the arts and crafts so that they could be as interchangeable as possible. Even then the goal was not entirely achievable. The gap was bridged by the specialists, the optiones or chosen men, of which there were many different kinds. For example, a skilled artisan might be chosen to superintend a workshop. The supply administration was run as a business using money as the medium of exchange. The aureus was the preferred coin of the late republic and early empire, in the late empire the solidus came into use. The larger bases, such as Mogushikam, minted their own coins. As does any business, the base quastorium required careful record-keeping, performed mainly by the optiones. A chance cache of tablets from Vindolanda in Britain gives us a glimpse of some supply transactions. They record, among other things, the purchase of consumables and raw supplies, the storage and repair of clothing and other items, and the sale of items, including foodstuffs, to achieve an income. Vindolanda traded vigorously with the surrounding natives. Another feature of the camp was the military hospital, Valetudinarium, later Hospitium. Augustus instituted the first permanent medical corps in the Roman army. Its physicians, the Medici Ordinary, had to be qualified physicians. They were allowed medical students, practitioners, and whatever orderlies they needed, i.e., the military hospitals were medical schools and places of residency as well. Officers were allowed to marry and to reside with their families on base. The army did not extend the same privileges to the men, who were not allowed to marry. However, they often kept common law families off base in communities nearby. The communities might be native, as the tribesmen tended to build around a permanent base for purposes of trade, but also the base-sponsored villages of dependents and businessmen. Dependents were not allowed to follow an army on the march into hostile territory. Military service was for about 25 years. At the end of that time, the veteran was given a certificate of honorable discharge, Honesta Missio. Some of these have survived engraved on stone. 
Typically they certify that the veteran, his wife one per veteran, and children or his sweetheart were now Roman citizens, which is a good indication that troops, which were used chiefly on the frontier, were from peoples elsewhere on the frontier who wished to earn Roman citizenship. However, under Antoninus Pius, citizenship was no longer granted to the children of rank and file veterans, the privilege becoming restricted only to officers. Veterans often went into business in the communities near a base. They became permanent members of the community and would stay on after the troops were withdrawn, as in the notable case of St. Patrick's family. Topic. Duties Conducted in parallel with the ordinary activities was the duty, the official chores required by the camp under strict military discipline. The legate was ultimately responsible for them as he was for the entire camp, but he delegated the duty to a tribune chosen as officer of the day. The line tribunes were commanders of cohorts and were approximately the equivalent of colonels. The six tribunes were divided into units of two, with each unit being responsible for filling the position of officer of the day for two months. The two men of a unit decided among themselves who would take what day. They could alternate days or each take a month. One filled in for the other in case of illness. On his day, the tribune effectively commanded the camp and was even respected as such by the legate. The equivalent concept of the duties performed in modern camps is roughly the detail. The responsibilities cure of the many kinds of detail were distributed to the men by all the methods considered fair and democratic, lot, rotation and negotiation. Certain kinds of cura were assigned certain classes or types of troops, for example, wall sentries were chosen only from velites. Soldiers could be temporarily or permanently exempted, the immunes. For example, a triarius was immunus from the curae of the hastati. The duty year was divided into time slices, typically one or two months, which were apportioned to units, typically maniples or centuries. They were always allowed to negotiate who took the duty and when. The most common kind of cura were the posts of the sentinels, called the excubi by day and the vigile at night. Wall posts were presidia, gate posts, custodia, advance positions before the gates, stationes. In addition were special guards and details. One post was typically filled by four men, one sentinel and the others at ease until a situation arose or it was their turn to be sentinel. Some of the details were guarding, cleaning and maintaining the principia, Guarding and maintaining the quarters of each tribune. Tending the horses of each cavalry terma. Guarding the praetorium. Topic. See also. Fortification. List of topics related to ancient Rome. Military history of ancient Rome. Roman legion. Topic. References Topic. Primary sources Josephus. The War of the Jews. Trans. William Whiston. Wikisource. Population of Vindolanda 100 AD. The Tablets. SHTML. Vindolanda Tablets Online, The Roman Army, Activities. Center for the Study of Ancient Documents, Academic Computing Development Team at Oxford University Pseudo-Hygienus. Demunitionibus Castrorum. The Latin Library. Ad Fontes Academy, Latin Text Polybius. The Histories, English Translation, Book V. The Loeb Classical Library, Volume 3 Section V. Web Publication on Bill Thayer's Polybius site. Roman Government 160 AD. Military Diploma. Military Diploma of Discharge and Roman Citizenship. Metz, George W. Legion XXIV Website. Unknown Inscriber, 3rd century AD. The Tombstone. Tombstone of Initius Ingenius, Museum of Antiquities Website. Newcastle University. Archived from the original on 25 August 2006. Vegetius. Flavius Vegetius Renatus Epitoma Re Militaris Book 1. Armamentarium. Archived from the original on 18 June 2006. Selections, Latin and English juxtaposed by paragraph. Translator unknown. Publius Flavius Vegetius Renatus 2001. The Military Institutions of the Romans De Re Military. Digital Attic 2.0. Clark, Lt. John Translator, unknown editor. Brevik, Mads. Books I-3 only.
The unknown editor altered the translation to conform to modern usage and abbreviated the text. Access is by subtitle. Search only within subsection. Topic secondary sources Bishop, M.C. 2012. Handbook to Roman Legionary Fortresses. Barnsley, Pen and Sword. ISBN 978-1-84884-138-3. Campbell, Duncan B. 2009. Roman Auxiliary Forts 27 BC AD 378. Oxford, Osprey Publishing. ISBN 978-1-84603-380-3. Johnson, Anne Roman Forts of the 1st and 2nd Centuries AD in Britain and the German Provinces. London, Adam and Charles Black. ISBN 0-7136-2223-7. Kepi, Lawrence The Making of the Roman Army from Republic to Empire. New York, Barnes & Noble Books. ISBN 1-56619-359-1. Roby, Henry John a Grammar of the Latin Language from Plautus to Suetonius, 2nd edition. London, Macmillan. p. 453. Topic external links Below are a number of links to sites reporting or summarizing current research or thinking. Many are reprints of articles made available to the public at no charge. The historical researcher will find their bibliographies of great interest. Topic general Fortress Study Group Study group devoted to the knowledge of forts and fortifications of all times and Greek and Roman ones, with a journal fort and a newsletter casemate. Fortress Study Group. Army Picture Index. Illustrated History of the Roman Empire, roman-empire.net. Archived from the original on 12 June 2010. Retrieved 4 June 2006. Bell, Anders 2001. Castra et Herbs Romana, an examination of the common features of Roman settlements in Italy and the Empire and a system to aid in the discovery of their origins. CAC Undergraduate Essay Contest for 2000-2001. Classical Association of Canada. Lewis, Charlton T., Short, Charles. Castrum, Castra. A Latin Dictionary. The Perseus Digital Library. Ramsey, William 1875. Castra. William Smith A. Dictionary of Greek and Roman Antiquities. John Murray, republished on Bill Thayer's Lacuscretius site. The Roman Military in Britain. Roman-Britain.org. Archived from the original on 13 June 2010. Retrieved the 11th of June 2006. Links to a glossary. The Romans in Britain, glossary of military terms. Note that both Latin and Greek terms with the same meaning are included. Topic forts and fortifications Antonin Wall Fort, Bearsden, New Kilpatrick, Strathclyde, Roman-Britain.org. Archived from the original on 10 June 2010. Retrieved 3 June 2006. Hansen, W.S., Friel, J.G.P. Westerton, A Roman Watchtower on the Gask Frontier PDF. Proceedings of the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland, 125-499-519. Iron Age Hilfert, Roman Stores Depot Brandon Camp, Lintwardeen Herefordshire, Roman-Britain.org. Archived from the original on 27 September 2006. Retrieved 3 June 2006. Lendering, Jonah. Haltern. Livius Articles on Ancient History. Livius.org. Nidham, Roman Auxiliary Fort, Neath, West Glamorgan, Roman-Britain.org. Archived from the original on 27 May 2006. Retrieved 3 June 2006. Pinata Castra, Roman Legionary Fortress and Marching Camps, Inchtuthill, Tayside, Roman-Britain.org. Roman Fortress. Time Trail. Exeter City Council. Archived from the original on 12 June 2006, Smith, William 1875. Vallum. A Dictionary of Greek and Roman Antiquities. London, John Murray. p. 1183. Article republished on Bill Thayer's Lacuscretius site, which has the advantage of linking to ancient texts cited by Smith. Tribus. The Roman Camp in Bonn. Eduvenet Services. The Roman Camp Sostra, BulgarianCastles.com. Archived from the original on 24 July 2008. Topic Camp Life Campbell, Duncan B. 2010. Women in Roman Forts, Residents, Visitors or Barred from Entry? Ancient Warfare. IV. 6, 48-53. Miranda, Frank. 2002. 
Castra et Coloniae, The Role of the Roman Army in the Romanization and Urbanization of Spain PDF. Quastio, the UCLA Undergraduate History Journal. Phi Alpha Theta, History Honors Society, UCLA Theta Upsilon Chapter, UCLA Department of History. Archived from the original PDF on 13 September 2006. Scheidel, Walter November 2005. Marriage, Families and Survival in the Roman Imperial Army, Demographic Aspects PDF. Princeton, Stanford Working Papers in Classics. Princeton University. Verboven, Conrad Good for Business. The Roman Army and the Emergence of a Business Class in the Northwestern Provinces of the Roman Empire 1st century BCE 3rd century CE PDF. In Lucas, de Blois, Elio, Lo Cassio. The Impact of the Roman Army 200 BC, AD 476. Economic, Social, Political, Religious and Cultural Aspects. Leiden and Boston, Brill. pp. 295-314. ISBN 90-04-16044-2